Good afternoon. I'm Scott Hensley, and I'm an editor at NPR's Science Desk, and I'm today's moderator of the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Today, we'll be talking about the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines, and I am uh, pleased to be the moderator for a distinguished panel of experts from Harvard and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Joining me today are uh, Nancy Messonnier, Director of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at CDC, Mark Lipsich, Professor of Epidemiology and Director of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics at the Harvard Chan School, Barry Bloom, who is the Joan L. and Julius H. Jacobson Research Professor of Public Health and former Dean of the Harvard Chan School, and Sandy Nelson, Associate Physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital. We uh, would be pleased to answer your questions later in the session, and you can email those to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. We already got quite a few questions to start with, but feel free to throw some others into the queue. This event is part of the Dr. Lawrence H. and Roberta Cohn Forum series. The forum thanks the Cohn family who are watching online today. We're streaming live. We're also streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. Now, the first COVID-19 vaccinations in the United States outside of clinical trials began just over a month ago. Today, uh, more than about 17 million doses have been administered. But is the pace of vaccination fast enough, especially with new, more contagious variants of the virus now spreading in the US? And as cases uh, and COVID-related deaths continue to break records. Today, we're gonna look at how the vaccine is being distributed, what healthcare workers and policymakers have learned so far, and what we can expect as the rollout proceeds over the coming months. But before we begin with our panel discussion, let's watch a short news clip about President's, President Biden's plan to vaccinate Americans. This clip is courtesy of Reuters. But you have my word, and we will manage the hell out of this operation. U.S. President-elect Joe Biden laid out his plan to get Americans vaccinated and promised to do better than President Donald Trump in controlling the pandemic. Speaking near his home in Wilmington, Delaware on Friday, Biden said he would invoke the Defense Production Act to ramp up production of equipment needed for vaccine rollout, refrigeration, and storage. Our plan is as clear as it is bold. Get more people vaccinated for free. Create more places for them to get vaccinated. Mobilize more medical teams to get the shots in people's arms increase supply and get it out the door as soon as possible. Under Biden's plan, federal disaster relief workers would set up thousands of vaccination centers where retired doctors would administer shots to teachers, grocery store workers, people over 65 years old, and other groups who do not currently qualify. He has pledged to vaccinate 100 million Americans during his first 100 days in office as the coronavirus has killed more than 390,000 people in the U.S. and the death toll could reach 500,000 by February, according to a top Biden advisor. Biden said his administration will release the vast majority of doses when they become available rather than holding back a large portion to ensure that recipients can get a second dose, which had been the Trump administration's approach for much of the rollout. The Trump administration had aimed to give vaccine doses to 20 million Americans by the end of 2020, but only 12.3 million coronavirus shots had been administered as of Friday morning out of more than 31 million doses distributed to states, according to data from the CDC. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that video. I'd just like to point out that the uh, figures were from last week, uh, not Friday today. So um, I think we can get a more up-to-date view of how the vaccine rollout is going from uh, Nancy Messonnier. So Nancy, if you could kick us off with uh, telling us uh, where we are and where you think we might be going in general terms on the uh, rollout of the vaccine. Well, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you today. It's actually both easy and hard to believe that it's been a year since we first announced the very first case of COVID-19 in the U.S. 
But in a year, multiple vaccines have been developed, two have received authorization, and more than 15 million people are on their way to protection. Two million have completed the whole vaccine series. So while the rollout of the vaccine has been measured so far, daily doses administered continue to rise to more than 730,000 doses per day over the past week. And that's great progress, but we do need to keep charging ahead. In December, our Independent Advisory Committee, ACIP, identified groups to prioritize when vaccine supply is limited to ensure we're vaccinating people at highest risk from COVID-19, but also being equitable and fair with this precious commodity. I want to reinforce that ACIP and CDC make national vaccine recommendations, and we fully expect there will be local adaptation. Our guidelines are never intended to be walls or barriers between phases. They were meant to support prioritization when vaccine supply is limited. We expect that there would be overlap between vaccination phases. The new administration has set an ambitious but attainable goal of 100 million doses in 100 days. Speed is really important, but so is equity. Our goal has to be vaccine in every community in every corner of the United States. We need to ensure that the people who are most at risk are protected, but as vaccine becomes more available, we want everyone to have easy access to vaccination and that people have the information they need to be ready to roll up their sleeves when it's their turn. That's going to take hard work from all of us. Before I turn over to my colleagues, I wanna emphasize something that's always on people's mind when they think about vaccine, and that is vaccine safety. A vast network of safety systems keep monitoring vaccines once they're being used. For the reporters listening in, you might have already received an advanced copy of the study that will be published within the next hour about anaphylaxis. That's a rare but life-threatening allergic reaction after vaccination with Moderna's vaccine. The data continues to show that these reactions are rare after both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. Next week, during a special meeting of our advisory committee, we'll have a briefing on vaccine safety. It's really important to ensure the public sees that data and has the chance to hear about it from people who study this all the time um, to help put the data into context. Like other vaccines, like the flu vaccine and the shingles vaccine, some people might have short-term side effects like pain and swelling at the injection site or a fever or headache afterwards. That's especially true after the second dose. But these typically go away in a day or two. I want to end by saying that these vaccines are safe and effective, and they really are our best tool to end this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I'd like to turn now to uh, Mark uh, for his views on uh, where we are and uh, where we might going and what he might be able to tell us uh, about the vaccines. Sure. Thank you, Scott. And um, I must say it's a real pleasure to be on a panel with Dr. Messonnier. Uh, and my other colleagues, but especially to see government scientists where they belong in the public eye, speaking directly to people unfettered by uh, political control. Uh, and it is a nice change. Um, uh, we know now that there are two approved vaccines in the United States. They are both based on the mRNA technology, one from Moderna and one from Pfizer. Um, it is uh, the, the clinical trials of those were published um, showing a 95% reduction in <clears throat> the incidence of uh, symptomatic infection, meaning COVID disease, um, in, uh, and that that, uh, that reduction was seen across different age groups uh, and also for severe disease. Um, it was, uh, so, so these vaccines uh, indeed are highly effective in protecting people um, they are also uh, what we know less about uh, and are just getting hints about is how much they do to reduce transmission. The early evidence, I think, is actually pretty encouraging. Um, there's more evidence about the Moderna vaccine so far, but uh, there should be some more about Pfizer as well um, that suggests that it doesn't just keep you from getting sick, but it actually, to some extent at least, prevent, prevents you from getting infected and trans probably from transmitting to others as well. 
So all of that is very good and something we need to continue to um, study and, and monitor in order to understand exactly what these vaccines can do um, and how their protection works. Um, uh, I think that we've been hearing a lot about the emergence of variants of the virus, a natural process that um, occurs with all uh, viruses, but there are at least two important um, viral variants of great concern, one being the so-called UK variant or the B117 variant, which as far as I've seen from the data uh, to date uh, is, is uh, more contagious than the uh, older virus variants, but uh, does not seem to have a different uh, level of protection from the vaccines as best anyone has, has shown so far. So the vaccines should be equally effective. There is a degree of concern about the other variant, the so-called South African variant, um, where uh, some laboratory studies have shown reduced activity of the vaccine uh, and of some, some people's natural immunity against that variant. We need to continue to study that and to see that in populations and not just in laboratory studies. So those are both concerns and they emphasize the real need to uh, continue accelerating the rollout as much as possible because uh, to some degree it's a race between a more contagious virus uh, and, uh, and our ability to protect people. So um, more reason to uh, try to get the rollout as fast as possible. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Barry. Um, Barry, along with Mark, you're part of the Massachusetts COVID-19 Vaccine Advisory Group, which is giving advice on prioritization and distribution decisions in the state uh, for vaccines. Could you uh, tell us uh, about what some of the issues are that you're wrestling with now and uh, maybe uh, how that um, uh, would help people understand uh, some of the decisions that are happening around the country? Uh, thanks so much, Scott. It's uh, a pleasure to be with such distinguished colleagues and some friends. And uh, I want to start by saying it's a, been a huge privilege um, for our laboratory scientists to be on an advisory committee in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that has really worked very hard to consider uh, all the criteria and concerns that we're hearing about with limited supplies, who goes first, second, and third. So let me just start by building on what Dr. Messonnier had indicated, guidelines from CDC, which are consistent with guidelines from the National Academy of Sciences. There are three major things that go into decisions uh, of something like uh, scarce vaccines. One is called beneficence, which is how do you do the most good for the most people? Uh, the second is fairness. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor or urban or rural. Every life counts equally, and we have to view it that way. And um, the third is equity, and that is how to deal with the unequitable distribution of the disease among populations. What do I mean by that? We know that 80% of the deaths have occurred in people over 65 and 40% actually occurred in people living in assisted living or nursing homes. So these are very vulnerable populations that have to be considered. We know that Blacks and Latinx have between three and five times higher rates of hospitalization, data that we get and depend on from the CDC. Those are vulnerable populations. And then clearly people in rural areas have less access to heroic life-saving hospital technology, uh, they have to be given consideration. So the, the level of every state's considerations of these is how do we prioritize preventing deaths? And that means the elderly population and the vulnerable populations. How do we maintain essential societal functions? How do we keep the police, the fire, the emergency workers, the sanitation workers, and most perhaps important and relevant in the context of children who will not get these vaccines right away? How do we protect school teachers and get schools open? Um, and finally, 
what, Mar what uh, Mark has raised, the ideal of a vaccine would not only prevent disease, it would prevent people who are infected from transmitting it to anyone else. And we simply have no data that's credible at this point on how good any of these vaccines is at preventing transmission. And I agree with Mark, if it protects against disease, it's likely to do something to reduce the amount of shedding of virus. So we struggle and every state struggles with these trade-offs, but part of the difficulties is the states don't know in advance how many vaccines they're gonna get. And as you heard and read, most states have gotten fewer than they were promised. People have been uh, uh, told they could go to a site and get vaccinated. There are no vaccines there. So we are facing the decisions on phasing who gets first, second, and third um, in, a, in an area of high expectations and a great deal of uncertainty. And at least I, for one, hope that the Biden administration will help the CDC collect all the data we need so that we, every state knows in advance, everyone has a place they can sign up uh, by any means, by telephone, by computer. Um, I was stunned to learn that a city can only sign up for vaccines by Twitter. And I would ask you how many vulnerable communities know how to get on Twitter when even a former dean doesn't know how to do that. So I think we have a long way to go to make this easy for people um, to sign up for vaccines. And as everyone will say, the quicker we get them out, the fewer people that are sick, the fewer vaccines that can, uh, viruses that can mutate and the better that we'll all be. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, I'd like to turn now to uh, Sandy Nelson from uh, Mass General to talk about the experience there with uh, vaccinating healthcare workers and also her perspective as an infectious disease specialist. Sandy. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's, it's really an honor to be here um, amongst my eminent uh, co-panelists. Uh, just to frame my comments, uh, at Mass General, we have vaccinated about 19,000 of our employees. About 3,000 of them have received their second doses already. And we are part of the larger Mass General Brigham system, where we vaccinated about 52,000 of our employees, of whom about 10,000 have had their second doses. And I realize that I really represent just one hospital and one system. And my experiences, I think, will, are being replicated across the state and across the country. You've heard a little bit about the uh, challenges with defining um, how best to prioritize our limited supply of vaccine. And I will say that operationalizing those decisions is quite challenging. And I think we knew to anticipate early on that we would have issues with respect to the cold chain, with respect to the need to maintain distancing, during the vaccination process. But there were elements that we didn't envision. And one of them has really been how to identify at a patient level who is at most at risk of developing infection. There is guidance from the CDC, from the ACIP, from the state of Massachusetts, but actually translating that in a systems level when you have potentially millions of patients who can be candidates for vaccine is immensely challenging. And that can lead to some emotional frustrations. I think one of the things that really did surprise me about our employee vaccine rollout is the level of emotion that was, uh, that was viewed when people were both eligible for vaccine and then received their vaccine. And as Barry mentioned, there were issues with supply early on, and we as a hospital received less initial vaccine than we had anticipated. And so some of our healthcare workers who had expected to be vaccinated early, those who have been on the front lines, in fact, were not eligible, or I should say, didn't have a vaccine slot because we didn't have enough doses. And that led to a lot of frustration and really some significant anger. And I think for me really represented the incredible emotional toll that this year has taken on our frontline workers. But that lasted only a short time. And as the vaccines really rolled out, we then saw some tremendous elation. And what you're seeing now is really these, the product of that, the, the vaccine selfies that we're seeing on Twitter and Instagram. And I think as we roll out these vaccines to the general population, we need to be prepared to help people manage these emotions. The only other point that I wanna highlight is really to build on something that Barry discussed around vulnerable populations. And I think we in the, on the front lines have really seen this firsthand. We've seen that the individuals who are populating 
our hospital wards are not representative of the population at large, but they do have a, a disproportionate um, representation from certain communities and including those in, in uh, certain racial and ethnic groups. And that's really appalling. And I think that we are, as an institution, really um, firmly committed to ensure that at least our, um, that our employee and patient vaccinations are, um, are distributed with principles of equity in mind. But that has been challenging for many reasons. And with our employee rollout, we did see that those that signed up initially were more likely to be physicians and nurses than they were those who work in food services or uh, in, uh, in environmental services, even though they were offered the vaccine at the same time. And so we've really had to work through both structural barriers as well as information gaps in ensuring that this population of vulnerable employees is well represented, well represented amongst those who get their vaccine. And I think we need to apply those lessons that we've learned in our hospital system and in hospital systems across the country as we begin to roll this vaccine out to the general population. Thanks. Thank you, Sandy. I really appreciate that. I think we're going to come back to uh, some of those issues in our discussion. Um, I think uh, thank you to all the panelists for helping us frame that conversation and uh, teeing up some things that we're going to get to in some more detail. I'd like to remind people who might just be joining us that uh, this is the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and today's uh, panel discussion about the COVID-19 vaccine rollout is uh, presented jointly with NPR. I'm an editor on the science desk at NPR. My name is Scott Hensley. If you have questions uh, that you would like the panel to address, uh, please throw them into our queue. Uh, you can do that by email at theforum at hsph.harvard.edu. Um, and uh, I think that's the most efficient way to do it. Uh, before we begin the next part of our panel, uh, we're going to show another video clip, this time looking at uh, global vaccine distribution beyond the shores of our country. For some countries, it's a time to celebrate. This was a 54-year-old nurse in Sao Paulo. She became the first person to be vaccinated in Brazil. But in other parts of the world, few are being inoculated. The head of the World Health Organization is urging countries and manufacturers to spread doses more fairly around the world, criticizing what he called a me-first approach, leaving the world's poorest and most vulnerable at risk. I need to be blunt. The world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure. And the price of this failure will be paid with lives and livelihoods in the world's poorest countries. Tedros said the prospects for equitable distribution were at serious risk, just as its COVAX vaccine sharing scheme aimed to start distributing inoculations next month. Even as they speak the language of equitable access, some countries and companies continue to prioritize bilateral deals going around COVAX, driving up prices and attempting to jump to the front of the queue. This is wrong. 44 bilateral deals were signed last year and at least 12 have already been signed this year. He warns these deals would create the scenario COVAX hoped to avoid with hoarding, a chaotic market, an uncoordinated response, and continued social and economic disruption. The global scramble for shots has intensified as more infectious various variants circulate. Tedros said more than 39 million vaccine doses had been administered in 49 higher income countries. Just 25 had been given in one poor country. Thank you uh, for the video. I'd like to turn to uh, Mark and uh, ask if he could uh, talk with us a little bit about some of the uh, global equity issues and why is it uh, uh, so important that the vaccine not be that the vaccines not be uh, only available in in wealthy countries. Thank you. Well, there are clearly a number of reasons. The first is the obvious one, which is Dr. Tedros. 
uh, stated, which is the moral reason that uh, public health is a public good. It's something that matters to everyone. Um, and uh, indeed, just as we've seen within our own country that the people at highest risk and uh, who are most economically precarious are suffering more from COVID and their livelihoods are suffering more from the disruptions uh, of COVID. The same holds across the world that countries in which people are living on a dollar or two a day uh, are much less able to afford disrupting that, uh, that kind of uh, economic uh, activity. So there's a fairness issue and, and a more general moral issue. It's also worth saying that the efforts that led to, um, for example, the Moderna vaccine um, were multilateral global efforts uh, initially from the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which was an explicitly global mission to create um, vaccines that would be responsive to future crises. Um, and they guessed correctly in supporting work on coronaviruses starting four or five years ago. And uh, that is part of why we are where we are. So uh, the world invested, uh, many countries more than the United States, uh, I should say. And um, it's, uh, it's appropriate for the world to get them. There's also the fact that uh, viruses cross borders and uh, we need to um, we, we can't be safe until everyone is safe. So it's many layers. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. Uh, Nancy, maybe I could turn to you uh, about the domestic uh, outlook and uh, in particular something that Sandy brought up, which was uh, the push to uh, vaccinate healthcare workers. Uh, and I'm wondering, given the high priority put on healthcare workers. How's the nation doing in achieving that goal? And um, where do you think it needs to go from here? You know, in the process of prioritizing vaccination, both the CDC's advisory committee and the National Academy, and frankly, even the John Hopkins group, there's been tremendous consensus across the country that Healthcare workers are the frontline heroes that have been putting themselves at risk every day for the past year. And that includes a broad definition of healthcare workers, as Sandy said, not just the doctors and nurses, but the folks that have to clean up the rooms or the folks that are responsible for food services. And so um, among all the other complications that Dr. Bloom talked about in prioritization, that's the one that there was you know, very much agreement they needed to be front of the line. I think it is perhaps not completely surprising, but definitely frustrating to me that there's been a lot of hesitancy among healthcare workers. And I think that really bodes poorly. We count on healthcare workers to get vaccinated to protect themselves, but we also know that our communities look to our healthcare workers as, um, as meters of their vaccines. That is, if you're, um, if you're a healthcare provider or your cousin that works in a hospital, doesn't want to get vaccinated because they, um, they don't think there's enough information, what are you supposed to think? And so I really think it's a priority to make sure not only that we make vaccines easily accessible to them and understand, as Sandy said, that there are structural issues in terms of access, but that we also really need to take really seriously the need to educate healthcare providers, the broader um, community of healthcare providers, so that they feel good about accepting vaccine and also that they use that to help influence their communities. I'm especially concerned about vaccine hesitancy among long-term care facility staff. Long-term care facility staff um, traditionally also have lower flu vaccination coverage, which really suggests that there's space to go in terms of education. And we are seeing the same kind of hesitancy now in these COVID vaccines. I'm hoping that week upon week as the data continues to climb, as we continue to see that these vaccines cause some um, local side effects, cause some fatigue, but that, that it goes away quickly, that we can loop back and ensure that healthcare workers have another chance to get vaccinated. And, you know, I'm really hoping that we will use them as a model that no community should be left behind and that we need to continue to educate and make vaccines available broadly. Sandy, um, 
you talked about some of the challenges in your health system. What are some of the things that have worked as far as education goes in uh, trying to address some of the questions that Nancy just brought up? Um, yeah, I think that uh, just to, to follow up, you know, we did have, we do track this as a system and we did note that early on with our vaccine distribution process, there were more individuals um, in certain groups that were, were going to sign up for the vaccine. And it was really a an active process which required an individual to, uh, to choose to uh, sign up for a vaccine. And I think one of the things that we've done is really move that process to the community. And we have individuals now that are going to the food services units and we're going to the environmental services home base uh, to conduct uh, training sessions that are also um, culturally and uh, appropriate by language. We've conducted these sessions now in six different languages. And I, I will say that we have moved that dial. So although our initial uptake was not great, and while there are still differences between these racial and ethnic groups uh, and, uh, and persons who are not of color, um, it is a lot closer than it was when we first started. I think the other piece, using that, that vaccine selfie um, that has really become so popular on, on Instagram, the idea of having a champion, and when we have these individuals, exactly as, as Nancy mentioned, who have had their vaccine, that can show up an image of it and explain to their fellow um, community members why they chose to be vaccinated, that can be far more popular um, and effective than really any public education campaign that we conduct. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I wanted to uh, bring up another uh, group that's been prioritized for vaccination, and that's uh, older people, people 65 and up. A uh, Kaiser Family Foundation poll that came out this morning said that a majority of those uh, folks who hadn't already been vaccinated weren't sure how to go about doing it. They didn't know how to register. They didn't know um, really uh, the first thing about getting started with the, with the process. And um, I wondered if I could ask Barry first to talk about um, his work with the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts and thinking about uh, prioritizing groups and then how to think about uh, making sure that the process works for a variety of people, including older people who may not be as uh, uh, on Twitter, for instance. So, uh, you know, Barry, what, what do you think? And then maybe we could ask Nancy to comment too about the, the efforts and how they may be changing. Uh, I mentioned that, th uh, thank you very much, Scott. Um, um, I mentioned uh, that I thought it was a privilege to be able to serve on this committee, uh, which is made up of, a, of an extraordinary diverse group of leaders in the community of Massachusetts uh, from um, religious leaders who I wouldn't ordinarily see in the course of my daily work uh, to um, uh, representatives of major medical establishments, hospitals, um, um, uh, people who run community health centers, people who uh, represent um, rural districts in the Commonwealth, uh, a state senator who spends time on the committee. Uh, this is an extraordinary um, cross-section of leadership, deeply concerned to meet all of the ethical values are quite aware of um, the needs of the elderly. And one of the things that I found most extraordinary is they have numbers on everything. We know how many people are in assisted living. Uh, we know how many uh, community health centers there are. We know how many people show up at community health centers. We know how many people live in the rural districts. We know what the uh, places where vaccines would have to go. Um, the state has done a remarkable amount of homework that I think is unseen by most, but they are held up by information on when they'll get vaccines. The uh, companies and the delivery systems do not go through the state. They go directly to the pharmacy or um, the distributor uh, that gets them to the place where they're to be given. And I think as everybody has previously said, what the public is desperate for is information of what does it mean for me. And I'm pleased to say that the Commonwealth set up a dashboard, which I think is a model that tells you exactly how many vaccines have been given to the state, how many have been put into people's arms, whether they're first and second, 
there are reminders built into the system to get people um, to come back. And um, I think that's an obligation of every state. Um, and there's a map of where the current sites are that would enable people to find where they can go when they have their turn to get vaccinated. The problem right now is we don't have enough vaccines and probably don't have enough uh, vaccinators. But uh, it's a little crazy, I have to say, that each of the 50 states has to reinvent the system of how to inform people about the value and safety of the vaccines and how to sign up for it, which is the question that I keep getting in my email, uh, how do I do that? So we would be very well uh, to have a national guideline or template that would help all the states move more quickly. Nancy, I think he's uh, throwing to you with these uh, closing <laughs> remarks. So uh, you're probably not surprised, but uh, what can you tell us uh, about reaching uh, some of the at-risk groups and simplifying this process to the extent that it's possible? Yeah, uh, thanks. I do think this is a complicated equation. And I wanna just say that clearly we need more vaccine. We need more people um, that are um, more places to get vaccinated and we need more education, period, definitely. I do think though, going back to what Sandy said, is that it's not just that, that it's going to be really complicated. And a lot of very detail-oriented work to make vaccines easily accessible to everybody. So um, my parents are in their 80s. They're you know, fortunately in very good health and they have a highly motivated daughter who wanted to get them access to vaccine. They were prioritized, but I wanted to get them access to vaccine. So I um, looked at you know, online where vaccine was available near them. I led them through the process of signing up Last weekend, they drove more than an hour to get to their vaccine appointment. And, um, you know, they're, they've gotten their first dose of vaccine. Um, but a lot of people aren't like that. They're not as healthy. They don't have a highly motivated daughter who knows how to work the internet. Um, and they can't drive themselves an hour on a weekend to get vaccinated. And I think, you know, there is this um, need to do more than just um, online um, maps to know where people need to get vaccinated. So what else needs to happen? Um, for me, part of, the, part of the need here is to understand that while people still trust their own healthcare provider first, in many communities, the second most trusted source of information is community leaders and religious leaders. And that we really need to think about immunization as a community level issue. We really need to be working with community organizations to understand not just how to get the right messages to the right population, but also how to best access those populations. And we can't think about that really as a national scale. We can't even think about it as a state scale, it really is a, a community by community effort to translate what Sandy said they're doing in their hospital system across the United States. It's going to be really difficult it is going to require detailed work. We're working with a lot of community organizations to try to really um, figure out how to get at the community level. For example, we're working with a group called the Black Coalition Against COVID. I think those kind of community organizations and the groups that are trying to organize them are going to be key to ending the pandemic by getting vaccine to everybody who needs it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, we've got uh, just a slew of questions pouring in as we've been talking, and so I'd like to try and tease some of those up right now. There are several questions on a similar theme around uh, the dosing schedule. And, um, you know, is it okay to go with one dose while the vaccine is in short supply or to extend the time between the first and the second dose? And I'm wondering um, what the panelists may have to say about um, the, those, those questions. What, what answers are we able to give people? And I don't have a particular person in mind, so feel free. Uh, Nancy? Yeah, so um, 
This is a really good question. And I, I want to start by saying that um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, the two-dose schedule has actually been remarkably effective. The estimates are around 95% vaccine efficacy. And that translates to if you vaccinate 100 people and you expose them all to COVID, 95 will be protected and five won't. It's actually better than was expected when the clinical trials were starting. Some experts have proposed that in order to maximize the available supply of vaccine, we give people one dose or we extend the intervals between the doses um, or we change the amount in the dose. And it's, um, it's those discussions that I think you're reflecting and I understand why the public has that question. They're all reasonable questions. But the problem is that we have no data to say that any of those strategies will be effective. The data that we have is on a two-dose vaccine at the recommended schedule, 21 or 28 days. And you know, a variety of scientists have looked at this, um, thought it through. And at this point, we at CDC agree with what FDA has said, and FDA has been very clear that we should be using the approved regimen now. It's rooted solidly in the science and the available evidence. And to do something different than that, would be not following the science and potentially not allowing us to really realize the full potential of these vaccines. So for now, from a CDC perspective, we think that it has to be two doses on the recommended schedule as researchers and scientists do clinical trials to see if there is some alternative. Thanks, appreciate that. We've got a bunch of questions about the variants of the virus. Uh, the one seen in the UK, uh, which Mark mentioned, uh, South Africa, and also uh, Brazil. And um, I know in yesterday's uh, White House press briefing that Dr. Fauci talked about <clears throat> his uh, concerns about some of the variants and keeping an eye on them. Uh, my first question has to do with uh, what confidence do we have that the existing vaccines would work against the known variants? And I'm wondering, uh, Mark, do you have any uh, uh, insights into that based on uh, the design of the vaccines and some of the research so far? Um, I think I might uh, defer to, to Barry Bloom. I, I do just want to say something briefly on the previous topic about the extended dosing intervals. Um, I agree that the data are about a, a three to four or four week delay. I think it's important for people to understand that there will be some situations where it takes longer between doses. And there's every biological reason to believe that uh, the second dose will be at least as effective six or eight weeks after. We don't have data proving that, but we have data from other vaccines and people should not hesitate to get the second dose if for some reason they can't get it when they've had it when on exactly the schedule that was, was planned. Um, about the variants, I don't know. I think I'll, I'll punt that to, to Barry Bloom. Um, Barry? Happy to, to pick it up. Um, <laughs> you know, RNA viruses um, have a Darwinian struggle, not against the human race, but against each other to see which virus has a better chance of surviving in the world. And we are, at this point, the world for those viruses. So it isn't surprising, uh, all viruses make mutations. The expectation is about one a month for an RNA virus. And if any mutation is beneficial, it will have an advantage. Clearly the British uh, strain uh, B117 seems to be able to be more transmittable, whether it's because it binds better to the host or has other properties that enable it to travel faster. We don't know, but we do know that gives it a huge advantage. And a 50% increase in transmission means a big increase in cases, hospitalization and deaths, which makes this a very large threat. And the question that your uh, uh, listener had uh, raised, will the vaccines protect against the mutants? And the answer is very, very early days. For the British strain, it is clear that the um, antibodies produced by the vaccine neutralize that virus. So I feel pretty confident for the moment that vaccinating people there or wherever that strain is, is going to be pretty protective. The worries come up with the um, 
uh, the Brazilian and South African strains which have common mutations. And if you look at the very small preliminary unreviewed studies, they are less neutralized by convalescent serum from people who have had the infection and got over it. And not everybody who has a mild infection makes a terrific immune response. So we can be hopeful to some extent that maybe vaccines can do better than natural infection. And only now are, uh, is it possible for people who've been vaccinated to have their serum collected in numbers enough to answer the question, if we take the new variants, are they neutralized by the serum of people who've had vaccines? And the answer at the very earliest stage is thus far, yes. They may be diminished in activity by a most recent paper, but in fact, they are not total escape variants. Whether that can change over time as people and viruses get more antibodies, we don't know. The hopeful aspect is the speed and the technology used in these vaccines means that if it's necessary to put a different spike protein that would enable a vaccine to be good for these strains, that's about a six week job for a company, maybe eight weeks. And I don't think the virus is gonna win this war, but we have to be vigilant. And remember, if we do add strains, we don't get rid of the old strains because those viruses will still be certain. So we have to add to the viruses and I would say since 1796, when the first vaccine against smallpox was discovered by Edward Jenner, vaccines are an iterative process. Very rare that the first vaccine is the one that works over the long haul. So this would be nothing abnormal in the process of making vaccines. Uh, on the subject of vaccines, we've gotten some questions about uh, confidence in the vaccine safety. And in particular about the ingredients and if there's any cause for concern based on how these vaccines have been made and the speed with which they've been uh, developed. And I'm wondering, uh, is, uh, is anybody uh, among our panelists uh, able to comment or answer those uh, questions? I'm happy to, to take a stab at that. I think, you know, although these are new vaccines, the mRNA vaccines in particular, they're, they're using a platform that has been um, developed over time. And so there actually is some um, experience with these in, in other um, in other settings that allowed them to rapidly scale this into a productive vaccine. You know, I can say that um, that the concerns about Operation Warp Speed are real. We hear these from our patients, the concern that we, we really moved this too quickly. And this is one of the common reasons that we hear people are hesitant about um, receiving the vaccine. You know, we have now experienced in a large number of healthcare, uh, healthcare workers, you know, we are now at the point where we've had millions of vaccine doses administered. And so that is much larger than the 30,000 patients that were in the clinical trials. And the reported side effects are really fairly close to what is being seen in the, um, in the vaccine studies. These vaccines are fairly reactogenic. So people are suffering side effects, including soreness and fatigue and headaches and the like, and perhaps more than other vaccines. Um, but I don't know a single healthcare worker who has received the vaccine who would say that they would trade that for the real disease. Um, and so there, there really is not, I think, a concern about the ingredients per se or the speed. There have been a number of internet rumors and I won't go into them and we are working to dispel some of those um, in, in language that we can really share um, and in communities of relevance. Thank you, Sandy. I think that's very helpful. Uh, we've gotten several questions um, asking about once, the, once a person has been vaccinated, either with one or two doses of the, of the vaccine, um, is the pandemic over for them? Uh, what, what, what do, you know, do they need to keep wearing a mask? Um, you know, and then how do we uh, deal with this as more and more people are vaccinated? And I'm wondering, Nancy, if you might be able to talk to us a little bit about the sort of public health measures and interventions that uh, were deployed starting uh, early last year and how those may change or not as the vaccination rate goes up. Sure, I'm happy to start, and I suspect Mark might want to comment on this too. Um, 
you know, we should think about the measures that we're taking as sort of layers of protection. Um, wearing a mask is one layer, socially distancing is another layer, and now we have a vaccine that is yet another layer. We all hope, and there is preliminary data that suggests with at least one of the vaccines, that it not only protects the individual that's vaccinated, but it also protects that individual from having the virus in their nose and throat, which then means that it protects them against transmitting it to somebody else. And that's what we all want. We want people to get vaccinated, not only to be protected themselves, but also to not be able to transmit the virus. That's what the data suggests, but it's really not clear yet. And so I think we need to ask people for a while longer to be vigilant, to wear masks and to um, socially distance. But we're working really hard to accumulate that data I'm really hoping that soon we'll be able to say, at least for people who are fully vaccinated, they, they can ease off those precautions some. I would say in the short term though, none of us want somebody who's vaccinated to protect themselves than put their friends or their family at risk. And so, you know, I, I think it's a time for a vigilance for a little bit longer for caution, given where we are in the pandemic. But I hope very soon that we will, that our scientists will feel confident ratcheting back some of those precautions. I wonder, Mark, if, if you agree that this is where we are on this issue? Yeah, thanks, Nancy. I think that's exactly right. Um, it's, as I say, there's a little bit of data from the Moderna trial where they swabbed people who came in for their second shot and found a reduced level of virus in the noses of those people in the vaccine group compared to the control group. A really clever design uh, feature of the trial, by the way. Um, and, and some other data from some one of the other vaccines that's not approved in this country. Um, so there's, there's, there are hints, uh, and more than hints, there, there are data suggesting that you're less likely to have the virus and therefore less likely to infect others. But the but they're very small numbers. Uh, they haven't been replicated. Uh, we don't have such data yet, as far as I know, for the Pfizer vaccine. And you know, if you say some, to someone you're 95% less likely to get sick, that's great for the individual. If you say you're 50 or 60% less likely to infect your grandmother, eh, that's not, if that's really the number, and if there are many questions still, that's not that reassuring. You probably still want to take precautions. So I think we really do need more data, as Nancy said. Um, uh, and I think the other point, uh, the other perspective is just that uh, these are layers. And when, you know, there are things working for us and things working against us. As the vaccine builds up some level of immunity in the population, some of it even to transmission, that will help slow things uh, social distancing and other interventions will help to slow things and masks. And on the other hand, the variants are, are likely to increase the amount of transmission as they become more common. So it's going to be a, a balance and that's all the more reason to keep, uh, to keep efforts uh, up to, to take prevention measures. I must say we, on a previous one of these discussions where uh, my colleague and co-author and wife was on, and we were uh, we were being interviewed about schools. She made the point that knowing the science and making smart personal decisions are two different things. It's actually really hard to think through all these things in one's own life, even as a scientist who does who does the uh, does the work every day. Um, and so I think uh, it's just it's just to point out that it's very tempting to. Um, to try to get back into real life again. And uh, it requires explicit efforts, uh, even for those of us who do this all, all for a living to remember that we really need to take precautions still. I think we have time for one more question. And Mark, that actually leads into the question that we've been getting in various forms uh, over the course of the, the panel. And that is, um, when, when will life get back to normal? Uh, is there, um, you know, a sense of, uh, given the vaccine rollout and what we know about the course of uh, COVID-19 so far, um, a thought about when we might be able to uh, get back to a more normal life and uh, not have to worry as much? And uh, maybe I could start with 
Barry, uh, and then uh, if anybody else would weigh in, uh, I think that would be great. And then we'll go to closing remarks. Uh, as Yogi Berra once acutely said, um, it's really tough uh, making predictions, particularly about the future. Um, we have really no idea. We don't know how long immunity lasts for any of these vaccines, which is a critical issue. Um, we have no reason to believe given the fact that we have cold viruses in the same coronavirus family that are here every year, uh, we have no reason to believe this virus is going to go away like SARS did in 2001. And um, we have reason to believe that we can reduce it to a very low level. Uh, so my sense is we will go back to close to what normal life was beforehand. But the threat of virus as China is now seeing being imported if people around the world are not vaccinated. Uh, we'll keep introducing the virus even as we have it hopefully under control as Tony Fauci said by the end of the summer. So I think we'll go back to a new normal but as I think Mark and everybody would agree we will have to be very careful and maintain many precautions to prevent the virus from popping up again. Yeah, I think I think everything Barry says is true, and I, as usual, and, and I would add to that um, that the uh, this depends on us, right? This depends on the level to which we are able to get vaccine out into the population, the level to which, especially those at highest risk, uh, if they do get infected, um, the elderly and those with underlying disease in particular decide that it's, uh, decide to take the vaccine and have access to doing it in a, in a way that works for them. Um, I, I personally am skeptical that we will get cases down to the double or triple digits uh, anytime in the foreseeable future. I think this virus is, is with us to stay, but um, other coronaviruses have come into our population historically um, and they probably were quite bad when they first arrived and now they cause common colds. There's been some modeling to suggest that that's the likely course of events with this virus. But I think in the short term, the way that we get from crisis to something closer to common cold is to protect those who are most, uh, most at risk of severe outcomes. So getting the vaccines to the elderly, to those with underlying conditions, and those with high levels of exposures like those in prisons and homeless shelters uh, is absolutely critical uh, to protecting all of us and protecting our healthcare system, which is wh where we started out when we started worrying about this uh, 12 months ago. Thank you, Mark. I think, uh, unfortunately, we've uh, exhausted the time that we have for questions. I tried to uh, pull together as many as I could and uh, thank you to our audience for submitting such uh, smart questions and my apologies for not being able to get to everyone. I'd now like to uh, turn to Sandy, if I could, for a closing remark, and then we'll go through the panel and ask each of our panelists to uh, uh, give us uh, a takeaway. Sure. So I think, um, you know, building a little bit on what Mark had mentioned, I think there are a lot of priorities with the vaccine rollout. And I'd, I'd really like to use my time to advocate for getting the vaccine to the places where the disease is and where the impact has been the greatest. And as we do that, I'd like for all of us as individuals and in members of our organizations to think about how we can help in that process, whether it's by, um, by volunteering, whether it's by, um, by sharing information or recruiting our community community and religious leaders to help in the effort. I do think that we owe it really to, to those that have suffered the most. And I think from um, a pandemic standpoint and epidemiologic standpoint, reducing the burden of disease is gonna be the key priority to getting this under control. Also with, with the rollout, I just want to encourage patients because the emotions around this are pretty profound. And when we say that people who are 65 and older are eligible, that doesn't mean that there will be vaccine appointments for everybody who is 65 and older. And that is okay. The vaccine will arrive. We will get the vaccines to everybody who needs it. We just need to be patient and keep doing what we're doing. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, Nancy, would you be able to pick up now with uh, your observations? Yeah, thank you. And I have to say my um, 
My last thoughts are similar. Um, these are safe and effective vaccines. And I really believe that along with continued social distancing and wearing masks, they're our best tool to get us back to some new normal. Um, it's been a hard year for, I think, so many of us in so many different ways. And I know people are frustrated um, that, that there's not enough vaccine for everybody today. You know, I haven't actually been vaccinated yet because I'm not in one of the highest priority groups and um, waiting my turn is, is difficult. And what I would ask people to do is to um, try to be patient, but to use their time wisely to get educated about the vaccine and to help other folks in their communities get educated and get organized so that when vaccine is available, we're ready to roll it out everywhere. And so I think that in this time, what we have it's not the time to just kind of impatiently wait. It's the time to be actively waiting, um, organizing, educating, and being ready to go as soon as there's enough vaccine. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. Mark, um, what, what, what can you share with us? Thanks. Um, I, I'd like to just inject a, a note of positivity and then, a, and then re return to the question about the globe. I think it's worth remembering that not only has this year been a kind of a whirlwind, um, but that this was the fact that we are here with some vaccines that work uh, and are safe is a testament to a lot of hard work over the last year, but also to scientific forethought. Um, during the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa, it was noticed by global health leaders that there was not a fast enough, a bit, the world did not have the ability to respond fast enough. Um, uh, to these crises and a very deliberate effort uh, started by three uh, individuals writing in the New England Journal of Medicine, growing into the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations and a lot of work uh, in other places, um, laid the groundwork. They said, we need to be ready. Somebody guessed really lucky uh, and well that it would be the coronaviruses were, uh, it wasn't just a guess, it was an educated guess and it was a luck fortunate one. Um, that coronaviruses were important. And that's why we're here now to a very large extent. And so I think uh, um, scientific forethought actually won, helped win the game for us. Um, all of those people were really globally minded. And I think that um, just to return to this notion that uh, it's great that we're getting it out in the United States. Um, and I'm delighted that we are as a country returning to engagement with the World Health Organization um, as one small step towards fulfilling our global responsibility to um, to help get this vaccine, these vaccines out to the world as a whole. Thanks, Mark. And Barry, um, can you wrap us up? Um, I have a reflection that uh, is a little different than my colleagues. Uh, what I've thought about during this conversation is Ronald Reagan's uh, famous line that the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And uh, we've seen and discussed in this conversation some of the areas where the feds were not there to help, where the leadership, a coordinated plan, a way to link 17 government agencies with statutory responsibility to work in a coordinated way, of advocating for masking and public health measures and open and closing businesses, whether they were good for health or not, We've seen that, we've seen the difficulty in getting vaccines delivered, and we know we need help. On the other hand, we have to reflect on the fact that the government was there to help before there was COVID. Um, there was the race for vaccines that's been going on for 20 years. As Mark said, uh, people were planning with the new technology for any vaccine that came along. Agencies that most people haven't heard of called DARPA and BARDA we're investing in these RNA and other technologies before COVID existed in the hopes that when a new agent came, it could be plugged in and, and used. And the government is providing these vaccines for free to the public, which I think is absolutely essential. And um, they have invested and been allowed to invest through BARDA in companies that would not undertake a vaccine for an unknown agent unless somebody agreed to buy their vaccines. And those are advanced market commitments that were made by our government. So I think what I reflect is that COVID has made clear 
of the circumstances when in fact we the American people and the global community need government help. Um, Tony Fauci is a recognized hero, a great friend uh, who epitomizes in my view the best of public servants. Maybe it's time for us to appreciate the many unsung heroes like Nancy and her colleagues at CDC and the people at BARDA that work every day to protect the health and security of the American people. I think it's time to give some credit to the government and the people who keep us safe. Thank you, Barry. Lovely sentiment. This concludes our event for today. I'd like to thank everyone who joined us and to our wonderful panelists. The panel was jointly presented by the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and NPR. You can look to the forum website for more information on this and future events. Again, thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you again at another forum event soon.